Good afternoon, everybody. So I'd like to start my presentation off with a question. How many of you guys know what No Child Left Behind is? Okay, so that's most of the people in the room. Now here's a harder one. How many of you know what value-added assessment is? No one? All right, well, what I'm going to be talking to you about today is No Child Left Behind and uh, the subsequent act that was passed during the Obama administration, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and how they utilize value-added assessment. So value-added assessment is essentially a statistical test that takes the standardized test scores of students, the SOLs, and uses them to try and um, figure out the score of a school. Now, what's done with the score is that if the school reaches a high enough proficiency, they get extra funding. The reason that this was incorporated in No Child Left, Left Behind was because in the 90s, there was a lot of outrage surrounding achievement gaps. Achievement gaps are essentially where white, wealthy students, on average, perform better than poor minority students. And those groups tend to overlap, so you can kind of talk about them um, simultaneously. But <coughs> the thought behind it was that if we're giving schools an incentive to educate their students more efficiently by giving them money, offering them money if they do, then that'll help achievement gaps, right? Well, value-added assessment is not perfect. It has a lot of issues, and in my opinion, it's worsened these achievement gaps and degraded the quality of teaching. So the first issue with value-added assessment is if just looking at it mathematically, the statistics are not reliable or valid. The American Educational Research Association put out 12 categories that were um, intended for the type of statistical test that value-added assessment is to say, if you meet these requirements, then you are reliable enough that we trust what you're saying to us. However, value-added assessment only, re only satisfied <coughs> six of those requirements, and even some of those were conditional satisfactory. So this isn't even a, an established, researched, vetted statistical test. Some of the um, consequences that it's had, especially on poorer schools, have to do with teaching quality. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, score inflation. Essentially what score inflation is, is where teachers, particularly teachers at poor schools that are desperate to try and get more funding in order to increase the quality for themselves and for their students, start teaching to the test. I'm sure you guys have heard that term before. Um, an example from my education is teachers used to give out released SOL tests as study guides for our in-class tests. So essentially, the only skills that we were earning from these classes was how to pass a test and not learning about history, math, um, government, things like this. So the inflation is the score, the scores get higher marginally, but the quality of the score goes down. They're not worth as much anymore. The second issue is that there's something called a crisis in the teaching community. So what's happened with value-added assessment is researchers have seen that essentially the richer schools can offer a lot of money, competitive salaries to teachers. They offer these salaries and they get the qualified experienced teachers. The new teachers who are not quite qualified, not quite proven, end up going to poorer schools and working in horrible conditions. Value-added assessment has just given more money to these wealthy schools and continued to uh, drop these poorer schools into a hole. So they have, the class sizes have been increasing in recent years, research has shown. The misbehavior in school has been increasing in recent, sh in recent years. And these teachers end up quitting the profession before they really even get a chance to get to a better working environment because they're so burned out by these large schools that lack community, student engagement, and are placing so much blame on them and so much responsibility on them. The third aspect of value-added assessment and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act that has really um, hurt students, especially in poorer schools, is how the community aspect is ignored. There's no requirement for after-school programs, for community engagement programs, and this has been researched and shown to 
help students perform better. A really good example of this is Columbia. In the last few years, Columbia has completely revamped their education system um, into something that they call Escuela Nueva. And essentially this program, the biggest thing that it's done is brought students into the community. They're in local governments, they're in local organizations, and local businesses. And it shows them the accountability that they have to their community. And that's what's been increasing their achievement to record highs in Colombia all over the country. But in poor schools in the United States, things that bring students into the community are usually the first to go. Because when funding is cut, those are the ones that we're getting rid of. So how can having uh, an education that is lower quality and has lower funding actually affect students later in life? So there was a study done that showed that fourth through eighth graders who went to a higher quality and higher funded school earned more when they were 28 years old. So almost two decades later, these students that were in elementary school in poor, um, poor areas and vulnerable communities were more likely to remain poor and to perpetuate the cyclical system. As well, there was a study done where students from poor communities and from um, urban communities that were uh, had high crime rates and things like that were given a lottery to come into a private school and go there tuition free. Now, a study was done to see the effects of this by comparing them to their counterparts in the, the school of the district that they lived in. And what they found was that for female students, teen pregnancy went down 12.1% just from going to a higher quality school. And for males, incarceration rates went down 4.3% from the same outcome. So how can we fix our system to help these students instead of leaving them behind and adding more barriers to their success? The first thing is a focus on individualistic education. Again, um, Finland is a really good example of this. Their focus is on the individual, each student and what they need, each student and what gives them their own personal growth. Not comparing it to the rest, but comparing it to your own track record and your own achievements. In contrast, in the United States, the Value Added Assessment System and the Elementary and Secondary Education Act are basically set up on the premise that they're comparing school to school. So there's no, uh, there's no comparative look at how students are doing from year to year in the same school or how students are doing at the beginning of the year to the end of the year, what's working and what's not working. It's just, if you didn't do as good as this school that has lots more resources, programs, and engagement in their community, then you don't get as much funding. And that's another issue. Um, resource allocation is another thing that needs to be fixed. So the way that resources are allocated in the United States for public education is based on income tax. And the issue with this is that it creates huge disparities in the quality of education that students are, are being given um, arbitrarily. So there was a study done in Michigan that showed that within one given state, the spending on, in wealthier districts is three times the spending in poorer districts. If you're looking world or at, uh, nationwide, I'm sorry, if you're looking nationwide, the spending is 10 times more in wealthy districts than in poorer districts, just on average. That's not even the most extreme. <coughs> so clearly there's an issue in just the base quality of education and the base resources that we're giving to students who are in poorer, more vulnerable communities to start. So the question that I want to pose with all of this information given to you is if the public education sector was created to give the American dream to every single student in the United States, then why are we creating barriers to the students that we deem undesirables? Why are students who happen to be born in a poorer family, in a poorer community, being penalized in a system that does not treat everyone equitably and does not give everyone the same opportunity. Thank you.